I just wanted to welcome everybody here and to acknowledge country. We have, uh, I'm at ACU campus, so I'd love to commence the webinar by acknowledging the first peoples and the traditional owners and custodians of all the countries where we're meeting. Emily Hills and I are on Ngunnawal country. Adam Staples, Dr. Adam Staples is at Bendigo on Adam Jaja Warren, is that right? Correct, yes. And Associate Professor Matt Bauer, delighted to have you too. Uh, Matt is at Macquarie Uni, which is the Watamatagal clan of the Darug Nation, so he's in North Ryde in New South Wales, oh, well, or wherever his precise location is. Um, and we'll, we're going to hear from all three today, and they're going to take us through multiple connections. I want to um, I want to hear from each one of them on their different topics. I, we'll start with Emily, who will speak about the students that she sees as a teacher educator at the University of Canberra. And then Adam will talk to us about his work as a senior lecturer in arts education at La Trobe. And then Associate Professor Matt Bauer may take us a little bit further into the connections between technology and education and research in both those fields. Yeah. Uh, Matt, that Matt's there. That's great. That's that's visible. Uh, yeah. and, and your and your audio is good. Um, right. Okay. Uh, delighted to have Matt here, of course, known to nearly everybody. I'm just showing my own actual physical copy of one of the te uh, texts that I rely on in teaching our staff about technology enhanced learning. This is Matt's book from 2017. And Matt, you're also telling me that very soon, I couldn't get my hands on it, very soon there'll be a special issue that Matt's edited for EJET, for the British Journal of Educational Technology on um, immersive virtual experiences in education. But perhaps you're going to speak to us about that as well, Matt. Um, thank you so much, and uh, well, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Penny. You were always so kind and, and supportive. I really appreciate it. Um, and just, uh, I wasn't actually planning on, on talking about that um, BJET special section on immersive virtual reality in education. Um, but if anyone is interested in uh, immersive virtual reality, uh, then please do look it up. It's it's really just in the in in a, in, in a few days the editorial will come out, and the, all of the articles for the special edition are available online. Um, and hopefully it provides the evidence base for universities and schools to effectively use immersive virtual reality, um, which is a nice sort of um, segue into the topic that we're talking about. What can schools and universities sort of learn from each other um, and together? And um, the, the sort of the default position that I've come to with this is to really be thinking about what can't they learn from each other? There is really so much overlap with education and technology um, that I think it's probably easier to think about well, what can't we um, take from schools to universities or from universities to schools? And uh, it was good also, um, Penny, of you to, to mention my book because actually you know that was a that's where my brain defaults to in trying to analyze sort of the broad educational technology landscape a lot of the work that i did there was basically synthesizing hundreds of different research articles many of them related to school um, uh, education many of them related to university uh, to get a sense of what are the research underpinnings um, of the use of technology in education um, the, it's meant to be helpful for um, school teachers, but also academics and educational designers and pre-service teachers. Um, and just to, instead of sort of, the literature is huge out there for ed tech, um, and it's meant to sort of try and, and pull it together. Um, and it was, the, um, it was winner of the 2018 Association for Educational Communications and Technology 
um, Design Development Outstanding Book Award. Um, and what, what I'm going to do today is basically just follow that through very briefly um, and try and use it as a framework for thinking about what universities and schools can and can't learn from each other. So in, in the first chapter, it talks about the um, different imperatives for using technology. And I think these are the same, no matter whether you're talking about school education or if you're talking about university. We want to improve access to learning. We heard Adam talking about that. Um, developing digital um, uh, learning skills. There are these days in universities and schools, curricular requirements and professional standards. Um, there's a whole lot of frameworks out there to support technology use. Some of those do tend to relate more to um, school teachers. Some tend to have an emphasis more on university teachers, but there is, again, a tremendous amount of overlap. Um, and, and ultimately, at both levels, we're trying to use, uh, use technology to improve student learning outcomes. Now, those outcomes are inevitably slightly different, and especially if we're thinking right back into sort of primary school, in terms of the complexity, the, the capabilities and knowledge that we're trying to develop. So there might be some ways in which technology um, wouldn't you know, be uh, appropriate or, um, you know, depending on, on the su actual subject matter of what was being taught and its complexity. But barring that, the underlying principles have a tremendous amount in common. A lot of you, uh, well, you, I would say, are familiar with the TPAC framework. Um, that doesn't apply just to schools or just to universities. That um, uh, integration of technology content and pedagogy within contexts um, will be similar. The context changes, obviously, school versus um, university education. But you know that, that's the bit, the context bit, that we need to, I suppose, think through, not, not the sort of broad dimensions of what we're trying to do. The sorts of pedagogies we can use, behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, social constructivism, connectivism, they all are um, pedagogies that we more or less can use at both levels. Um, connectivism is probably one that we will have, we have to scaffold a bit more in schools because obviously there's the privacy and safety um, issues that we need to help younger children with. But barring or apart from that, uh, really all of those pedagogies are, are staple pedagogies in, in both um, levels of schooling. When we talk about analysing the affordances of tech use uh, and understanding multimedia learning effects, that's something that obviously applies to both levels. I was thinking about um, whether multimedia learning effects do apply for younger children. Um, and I've not really seen much at all that um, distinguishes between um, you know, multimedia learning effects for particular ages of students, although that could be a, a sub area of the multimedia learning research. But otherwise, um, we, we really do have all of those um, uh, effects that apply to both levels. Um, in terms of representing and sharing content, that's you know the the, the probably the area in terms of um, uh, the, the actual what is being learned that's different for the different levels. So that's something to to think about schools versus universities. Um, a lot of the frameworks in terms of design thinking and learning design, we do have a little bit of different. So for instance, some of Diana Lorillard's um, tools um, uh, and, and frameworks for, for creating learning designs are probably um, more relevant and analysed at university level. On the other hand, systems like LAMS um, is probably um, well often uh, or, or used a lot more in schools, so we need to consider those different levels. Um, and then when we look at case studies of using like online technologies, you know, they're used in, um, in schools and they're used in universities. Using social networking tools, well, um, has been used um, quite a bit in, in, um, in universities. These days there's a lot more around privacy and safety. So that's something that we tend to see more um, or less frequently in schools. Um, 
Although I, I actually think a, a lot of the social networking strategies that get used um, are often fulfilled through other tools these days um, that, are, that are used, like uh, even sort of things like um, Seesaw, Edmodo, Class Dojo, those printed and bound, um, and are more secure and private and safe um, sort of systems. A lot of the, the collaborative learning and sharing and friending even, um, that can happen in those um, systems. Mobile learning, again, the sort of the pedagogy that underpins mobile learning in terms of authenticity um, and um, situated learning uh, and collaborative learning, that's all things that can happen in schools and universities. Um, but it's uh, obviously that issue of um, safety again. So whether you're using an iPad that doesn't have a SIM card, might be the go in primary school or, or even high school, um, whereas universities are, are they're often using their own devices. And using virtual worlds. So, you know, there's, there's great things that have been done in universities in terms of, um, you know, virtual um, cadaver labs uh, in, in medical education. Um, in schools, a lot of design work can happen in, in, in virtual worlds. Um, and up these days, more and more in schools, um, we've got students using Minecraft and teachers using Minecraft. So this is probably a heavy slide that I won't really go into, but a lot of the, well, in fact, pretty much all of the design principles there about, you know, using technology um, in pedagogically flexible ways, providing access, facilitating communication, um, vicarious learning and reflection, student-centered learning, providing feedback, learning communities, those are all things that apply to both levels. And the issues like technical issues, student digital capabilities, cognitive load, collaboration problems, negative student dispositions, plagiarism, safety, privacy, equity, teacher digital skills, negative educator dispositions, inappropriate design, teacher support, they all relate to both levels. Um, and these sort of themes too, you think pedagogy, access, communication, content representation, motivation, engagement, uh, vicarious learning, digital uh, learning capabilities, assessment and feedback, all of them relate to both levels. Um, and even trends with future technologies, um, uh, Gartner's hype cycle, again, they're all things that we need to broach. So there's so little that um, schools and universities can't learn from each other. There are some specifics around safety. There are some specifics about the complexity of um, the, the content that's being represented. But by and large, we really should be drawing, um, considering ourselves a, you know, a, a single unified field to um, almost all extents, drawing from one another's experiences, um, build, um, uh, conducting uh, research together, I think is a really important thing that we should have more of, uh, and even potentially um, dive more deeply to, to investigate the very interesting question of what are the differences between um, school and university? Are there specifically things that we just um, cannot transfer? Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's sort of, a, I suppose, based on a very interesting topic that Penny presented, that's where my mind sort of landed on it, that we, we really should um, uh, be drawing extremely heavily um, uh, and working together between the two levels of education. Thank you so much, Matt. And thanks, uh, you, you were sparking a lot of uh, supportive and uh, engaged comment in the chat, which we have, th and thanks so much to everybody. Uh, we, we've got, we have got 10 or so minutes or, or longer to, to touch on a few of the questions that everyone has raised. But Matt, we're, we're, we're clapping you too um, across all of our spaces. Um, and looking in the chat, I'm enjoying very much seeing colleagues from, from my place and colleagues from uh, EdTech Posium and including, I see um, Russell, who's our host for next year's EdTech Posium as well. So everyone's been raising questions following on from, from your discussion, Matt, and it was great to hear the links between the three presenters. 
Uh, so uh, you're welcome to uh, put your mic on if you'd like to, to raise a question, but I had one that I particularly picked up in the chat that I wanted to um, ask ask the panel about. This is coming from each each of your um, your pre presentations as well. <coughs> Raylene was saying she would love to uh, think more about the collapse, perceived collapse, perhaps between the social, the personal, and the uni identities that the remote setting, the COVID setting has sort of brought to the to the fore. So um, Raymond, I don't know if you wanted to to state that better. Um, but uh, yes, so, so the question, I suppose that's just yes for, for comment. What does that mean for for these, for us as, as teachers and for the students that we see, the school students um, who've experienced that this this COVID year where their bedrooms have become mm -hmm. a public space for, for their class colleagues, for their teachers. Uh, and yeah. Perhaps, mm -hmm. um, Emily, do you have any thoughts there? Oh, well, my first thought would be that that's where we are right now is in my bedroom, actually. So <laughs> that's um, a nice segue. But um, yeah, look, I think it's it's been a real it's been a very humanizing uh, experience, and I think that's something that that we could leverage certainly across the sectors. Is that I know for me, working with pre-service teachers who were in partially virtual placements, and then you know they they were remote learning with me and then you know having to navigate those platforms together I think there was a bit of a, a camaraderie that that um, that came about because of that between myself as a teacher educator and then pre-service mm -hmm. teachers but then also that that flows into the work that we do at UC um, we've got a very strong partnership um, with the ACT um, directorate and so we actually work in a, in an affiliated schools project with 26 ACT public schools. And so we're working in those schools all the time and having those really rich conversations around what they're experiencing and, you know, what the teachers are doing and how they're doing it. And, and you know, Matt, I think that that um, you're saying that research, you know, we're in a really rich position in at UC to be able to do some of that work. And I, you know, if I had more hours in the day, I've, I've spoken to principals about that, how we can actually use what we've learned right now in this current context in research, active research right now to build capacity rather than do what is starting mm -hmm. to happen, which is kind of backslide into our comfort zones. And I do think there, there has been a kind of breaking down of some of those barriers where teachers have seen what it feels like to be in that position of discomfort. But I don't think that we've done enough to leverage that into, into learning like we've We've experienced it a bit, and there's, you know, there's the real opportunity to break down some of those barriers. But I don't know that we've done it well enough yet. Still potential, but but not yet. It's my two cents, anyway. Yeah, I think that um, uh, you know, the the move, the rapid move to the remote context, um. And pretty much by themselves meant that the the pre service teachers needed to you know I don't want to sound like a bro broken record but that they you know needed to be self directed in what they were finding out and how they how they were coming to know and just sort of anecdotally I have I've noticed a shift between you know a Zoom session 2019 which sounds you know, seems like a century ago to a Zoom session with students in September 2020. Uh, there's a lot more video that's on um, the sort of protocols, I suppose, that the Zoom netiquette. So there has been this, I think, because pre-service teachers have experienced what it is to be on the other end of Zoom, that there is a far better kind of um, uh, uh, integration, I suppose, of what's happening. And then what the, the other thing that I've actually really enjoyed finding out about is um, you know, each student has come back with different stories of of um, of netiquette protocols within each school, 
So there isn't this standard approach to what it was to operate in Zoom and, you know, that you know, obviously there are standard ones like you can't have private conversations with students or the rest of it. But it's been great that we've actually been, you know, filling up our our information bucket with all of this information from our pre-service teachers who've been experiencing something that we have not experienced. And I think that's the key thing, isn't it? That we haven't been in that position, whereas our soon to be graduate teachers have. So um, again, Emily, it is, it's about that research. There's there's almost too much of it, isn't there? You know, like we've got to we've got to find it and put it somewhere and do something with it. And there's just there's just too much in a way. Mm. Uh, I have a question. Teleadvisors? Yes. Uh, well, firstly, I just wanted to say thanks to Penny for pulling together such a, a um, cohesive kind of panel. Um, it's, I, I feel like we've covered a lot of different aspects of the, the relationship between schools and um, tertiary institutions, and I think that's been really valuable. One of the things, one of the themes that sort of came up in the conversation in the chat um, was digital literacy. I mean, that really does seem to be at the heart of um, some of the challenges that we're facing. And so I'd be interested to hear from the panelists if they have thoughts on how we can actually, what steps we might take to um, enhance digital literacy, both in schools and in higher ed. Matt will have a word at least. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll come at this from a couple of angles. So I'm, I'm on the um, ACARA review at the moment of the ICT general capability, um, which is, is essentially, and, and will potentially even, actually, I've got to be careful what I say, uh, but it, it could potentially be renamed instead of uh, ICT general capability uh, as digital literacy or digital fluency to, to make it a more up-to-date uh, term. Um, and, you know, it, it's been interesting in that review to see how that shifted over the last decade that they've um, been uh, in place and the, the sorts of, um, you know, I think there's been a, an increased emphasis on, on well-being, which is something that I'm pushing hard to have in the new um, capabilities. And then in terms of, though, how we develop um, people's capabilities uh, in, in schools and universities, one of the problems in schools is whose responsibility are general capabilities? Uh, and unless we have those general capabilities woven into the curriculum, uh, it, it, it curriculum, uh, sorry, syllabus documents for, for the learning areas, then it's very hard to um, assure that students will just pick up those general capabilities. We have to assign responsibility um, for particular capabilities at some point in order to have confidence that the students will achieve them. And I think the same thing in a way, and, and, and universities are even maybe more problematic because the definition of the curriculum often just resides with whoever the academic is who is responsible for taking a particular unit. And although there is a shift at the moment from, um, from unit-based um, programming to um, course-based programming of curriculum, um, it's still hard to guarantee within units, uh, and I know this from personal experience, that where are, for instance, pre-service teachers going to, um, are we going to assure that they have um, interactive whiteboard capabilities? We can sort of talk about it in staff meetings, but are we going through to each of our units and making sure that in the right places, people are picking that up? So I think there really do, does need to be a, a, a lot of coordination in terms of syllabus and curriculum. And hopefully the people who are in charge um, of those areas are also um, go, digging deep into making sure that, um, that, that the teachers at the coalface are actually uh, addressing them. So that was long-winded, but um, it's a pretty complex sort of issue. No, that, it, was, it was perfect, um, Matt. 
and uh, again, people people are certainly drawing that connection with the graduate attributes that universities um, carry around in all their buckets. Although Macquarie actually has it rather differently at the moment. But um, yes, whose whose job is it, and do they know that that is their job? Very interesting question. We should probably uh, stop the recording now for. Um, but we don't, tra televisors traditionally don't have a very firm cutoff on these sessions. But before anybody needs to leave, um, could I just ask us to, to applaud those three presenters and the value that they've showed to us today? Um, int so interesting from each of your different perspectives. And I just thank you so much for taking the time and, and coming to talk to us. So 